You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Toma Chanel. Toma Chanel is an assistant professor at the University of Tel Aviv, Israel. His research focuses on massive stars. He uses multi-wave spectroscopic photometric and inferometric data with the world's largest telescopes to infer the observational properties of massive stars and binaries in the local group. He developed and utilizes state-of-the-art model atmospheres and spectral disentangling algorithms to derive robust constraints on the progenitors of compact objects with the goal of advancing our understanding of the evolution of massive stars and binaries and the production of gravitational wave sources. Dr. Tomer Shinar, welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy to be here. Now, Doctor, there has been in the history of astronomy and to my knowledge, something on the order of a century, a strange star known as HD 45166. And the star just was an outlier. It didn't really fit anything that, that anybody could really tell. But we also didn't really know very much about it. So give us an overview of the weirdness of this star system. Yeah, so, so the star was first noted in 1933, like almost 100 years ago, by a female astronomer, actually, Carol Jane Anger. And she noted that, to the best of her knowledge, no other star looks like that. And ever since then, there has been generations of astronomers basically kind of obsessed with it. So the reason that the peculiarity of the star is that it looks like a type of star called Wolfreya star. So it's a well-known class of stars. We know a few thousands of them in our own galaxy. There, there should exist a few thousands of them in our own galaxy. And it, it, it looks kind of like a wolf ray star, but it has very different properties. So wolf ray stars are stars that are thought to be these very massive stars that are very evolved and on the verge of collapsing into neutron stars or black holes. They have these powerful outflows and they typically weigh at least eight times the mass of our sun. But this star has the same kind of appearance. It looks like a wolf ray star, but it's much lighter. It's much less luminous. It has a funny abundance pattern. So things that mostly astronomers get excited about, but in, in its overall picture, it just looks completely different. That's why it's called a quasi wolf ray star. Do you have any other suspects, analogs of this star, or is it still the only one that you see that's quite like this? So far, no other star has been classified like this as a quasi wolf ray star. That's the the only star that bears this name. Now, helium. This is also a helium-rich star, or at least the specific star we're talking about in the system. So what changes there? I mean, are wolf ray stars normal ones helium-rich in general, or is this an outlier in that respect? No, he, wolf ray stars, are almost all of them are helium-rich in general. And in this sense, it is very similar to wolf ray stars. So it shares some of the properties, like it, it's also hot and helium-rich. So it looks in many senses like a wolf ray star, but then there are all these other peculiarities. It, it, it's as if it shouldn't look like a wolf ray star. It looks like a star that put, put a mask on of a wolf ray star, but it in fact shouldn't actually look like it. So it is also helium rich, but it should not produce these typical signatures in the spectrum that characterize wolf ray stars, like these uh, strong uh, emission lines that indicate a strong outflow. That's mostly the, the, the sense in which it is an outlier. Now, that helium generation in a normal wolf ray star, is that simply due to the activity of the star and just the nature of these things and, you know, fusing hydrogen and doing what they do? Is that just a standard thing for them? Yeah, exactly. In fact, also the sun, right? It fuses hydrogen into helium. So if we could strip the outer layers of the sun and we could pierce into its core, we would see a lot of helium and we would call it a helium star. But typically stars that are or normal mass, say like the sun, they don't just get stripped for no reason. But wolf ray stars, they come from very massive stars, and it's actually a debate how exactly they lose their outer layers. But these wolf ray stars somehow manage to get rid of their outer layers, and you can see their cores, and these cores are enriched in helium that they produced while they were burning hydrogen. So this is what we see in this star as well. It's a star that somehow lost its outer layers. It's a helium-rich star and it remains to be investigated how exactly it formed, how did it lose its outer layers. Now, this is a binary star system, right? Yes. Could it be the other companion robbing it? Could that be involved? 
Definitely. I mean, that what, that used to be the natural thought, though, it's especially for stars of lower masses like this one, we don't really know of any other process that can cause them to lose their outer layers, except indeed of a nearby stellar companion that kind of sucks out the material away. And that was the idea for this star as well. If you look at the literature up until 2007, the last paper on this, this, this was the thought that the companion is very close and that it somehow robbed it of, its, of its material, just like you say. Problem is that in the current study, we actually find indications for this companion star to be very far away, like 10 astronomical units, very far, too far to have been able to actually robbed it of its material. Now, do you see in, in these, you know, both a wolf ray star and a quasi wolf ray star, do you see shells of gas that, that have been expelled or is that material just not evident? So in, in normal wolf ray stars, you, do sh you, you see that the defining characteristic of a wolf ray star is in fact that you see mostly this material being ejected from the star. You hardly see the stellar surface. And this is what happens in this quasi wolf ray star as well to a certain extent. The, the, in a technical jargon, the spectrum of the star is dominated by emission lines which to us means that it is surrounded by circumstellar material. It is surrounded by some gaseous uh, material. And now, since it looks like a wolf ray star, the natural thought, and that what everyone thought in the past, is that this is some sort of an outflow. The star is losing a lot of material, uh, Yeah, has this uh, behavior for some reason. In retrospect, we now know that this is not actually an outflow. This is, this is material stuck in the magnetic field lines, but that's something we haven't yet discussed. And that's where we go next. Yeah. This star is magnetic, which is highly unusual, yeah. especially in this case. It's very highly magnetic from what I can tell. Now, that is different. That is very different from, from a wolf ray star in general. So how did you determine that there was a strong magnetic field going on with this star? Yeah, the, the main challenge was to come up, let's say, with this idea in the first place. But what, once the idea was there, the process of how to determine it, the, the natural method of choice is spectropolarimetry. So what you want to do is to take an instrument called a spectropolarimeter. I have no idea to what, what kind of technical level am I allowed to get to and should get to. As far as you want to go, just assume, <laughs> you're, just assume you're talking to amateur astronomers. Okay, so spectropolarimetry is a technique that combines, as the name suggests, spectrometry and polarimetry. So you measure at the same time, you both break the light to its frequencies, that's spectroscopy or its wavelength, but you also look at the pol polarization of the light at every uh, frequency. And what you see when you do this for this star, in fact, the magnetic field is so strong that you don't even need the polarimetry aspect. What you see is a very clear evidence for Zeeman splitting. Zeeman splitting is an effect that happens when you impose uh, or, or um, a, a place a strong magnetic field on atoms. If you have some material, it's made of atoms, and I place it in a magnetic field, the electrons in the atoms basically have more states, more quantum mechanical states to reside in, and you see simply more transitions than you usually do. So if there is a certain atom, say, that typically has a set of frequencies that we associate with it, suddenly in the presence of a magnetic field, you would see all these frequencies split into additional components. That's what we call Zeeman splitting. And in this star, you simply directly see it. You look at the spectrum, and instead of seeing, say, a line at a specific frequency, you see it multiplied three times, which is a clear-cut evidence for Zeeman splitting and also enables you to measure the magnetic field. Now, give us a sense of the magnetic field of the star. What could we compare it to with, with our own magnetic field or our own magnets? I mean, how strong is this? Is this orders of magnitude stronger or comparable? Yeah, that's something I had to research myself because it's not uh, something we <laughs> I deal with every day, or most of us don't. So there are a few maybe helpful comparisons I can draw. The first is maybe Earth's magnetic field. Most of us are aware of that. I mean, we use compasses. The reason compass works and points to the north is because of the Earth's magnetic field. Birds use it to navigate. It's the phenomenon that is responsible for uh, northern lights and so on and so forth. So the magnetic field of the Earth we measure, one of the units of measurement is called Gauss. So it's 0 0.5 Gauss. That's the magnetic field of the Earth. And the magnetic field of this magnetic star is 43,000 Gauss. So that's one way to kind of compare it. Okay, it's, it's like almost 100,000 times stronger than the Earth's field. If we compare it to man-made magnets, so it depends 
let's say, a, a magnet on our fridge. Ironically, it's actually much stronger than the Earth is. It's about 100 Gauss. So it's like 200 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. The thing is that attached to our fridge, an MRI, if you ever did that uh, medically, that has a field that is about 15,000 or 20,000 or even 30,000 Gauss. So it gets closer to the field of the star. And it turns out that the strongest man-made magnet is about 10 times the field of the star. So that kind of builds your scale. So the impressive thing, actually, apparently human beings can produce magnets that are even stronger. But the important thing to understand here is that this magnet is, the entire star is a magnet. So it's this gigantic magnet, a star that is the size of our sun that has uh, this very powerful magnetic field. Any hypotheses on what is the physical mechanism for generating that magnetic field is? Yes, hypotheses exist in the literature, and we were also inspired by one of them. There are different principles of how you generate a magnetic field. One of the most familiar one is called the dynamo, dynamo effect, where you have moving charges, and that can give rise to a magnetic field. But that doesn't seem promising here because this is a star that its outer layers are expected to be very stable. It's called a radiative envelope. You don't expect any sort of crazy motion or any convection or anything like that that is necessary to produce a dynamo. So it seems to be a so-called fossil field. It's a field that got trapped in the star somehow. And the question is indeed, how the heck did it get there? And one of the ideas in the literature, especially in the last decade or so, is that such fields can be generated when two stars merge. So when you, when you take, say, two suns or two stars of different types and you merge them, through all this process and all this chaos and all this motion, a magnetic field can be generated and strongly amplified and then kind of get trapped in the radiative envelope of the star. So the star is, is giving some evidence of being a merger, the end result of a merger of two previous stars. What did those look like to produce this? Or can we even characterize that? What would what look like a merger? No, the, the, the stars that contributed to the merger, oh. in other words, were they, were they much, I assume, obviously much smaller stars, but what, what type can we even tell? Yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, it's a hypothesis in the paper. Of course, there is a limit to how much we can exactly know, but given all the evidence that we have, it's a bit difficult to conceive different ideas. So if you just take two normal stars, let's say we, we are, uh, this star seems to weigh about twice the mass of the sun. If you just took two suns and I would merge them together, the natural expectation is that it would be a star that weighs roughly twice the mass of the sun, but it would look like a star, a normal star that maybe has a strong magnetic field. It wouldn't be helium rich and compact and extremely hot. So to get this funny kind of helium star that is strongly magnetic, you, you, we, we don't expect this merger to have been just of two normal stars, but a pretty sophisticated scenario that I'll try to out outline very quickly and, and simplistically. So you imagine that the system started off as a binary system, right? Two stars orbiting each other maybe every few days or so. There are many such binaries. They exist out there. One day, the more massive star, you maybe you weighed five solar masses or so. It, it, it uh, evolved more rapidly in this binary. And when stars evolve, they tend to expand. And when the star expanded enough, it suddenly the material in its outer layers could no longer be bound to it and the companion as we discussed it, uh, before it started robbing it of its outer layers and so what you got is uh, a star that loses its outer layers it becomes a stripped star actually we have a name for it a sub dwarf in this mass regime it looks like a sub dwarf and the companion accreted a lot of this mass and so now you have a binary system of a helium star that was freshly born it's quite low mass maybe it weighs one solar mass or so or 0 0.5 even and pretty massive companion next to it, still a binary. Now the companion, this guy that accreted a lot of the mass, it's its turn to evolve. And now it wants to expand and become some giant. And again, it hits the helium star. This time, however, the mass ratio is very extreme. It's like one to 10. And when mass ratio is very extreme, the helium star is no longer able to accept this material and something else happens. It's, we call it unstable mass transfer or common envelope evolution. In this case, the stars sp start spiraling into each other. They develop these gases envelope around them and they end up merging. And all of this sounds pro probably crazy, but actually we have a lot of evidence for, we know that such binaries exist. We know that these processes will happen eventually. And so what you happened here is that you merge this helium star with the core of the other star, ejecting in part the, the material of the other star. 
And this gives rise to this funny, weird helium star that is strongly magnetic. This is what we propose in the paper. Now, this seems like a relatively, or what one ex would expect to be a relatively scarce state of affairs, which might explain why we don't see them, but also is time. So once you end up with a quasi wolf ray star, what do you think the time frame it is that it can exist that way before moving on to become something else that we'll get to shortly? You mean the lifetime of this quasi wolf ray star? Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's it, it from first principles it's going to be comparable to the helium burning lifetime of such a core which would be of the order of millions of years. So short astronomical time scales but not that short. So it can it can live in this state for quite a few million years. So quite a few, but million years as opposed to <laughs> ridiculously long persisting star. Now to take it further, when we start seeing magnetic fields like this, it reminds one of the end result of a giant star that can be a magnetar and also have a very strong magnetic field, but it's unclear why. Are we looking at a proto-magnetar here? Yeah, so the, the measured properties of the star support the fact that it is a proto-magnetar because to be a proto-magnetar from first principles, you kind of want the star to satisfy two criteria. You want it to one day become a neutron star, because magnetars are neutron stars, and you want it to have a sufficiently strong magnetic field when it collapses. Especially the latter, that we know without any doubt. We know how strong the magnetic field is. We have a, an, a formal error on this measurement. and So there is a principle called magnetic flux conservation. The magnetic flux doesn't go anywhere. It's a bit like angular momentum. When you shrink an object, like the famous analogies, like with a skater, uh, ice skater, right? When they sh when they kind of take their arms towards them and become smaller, they start rotating very rapidly. That's angular momentum conservation, and the same idea applies for magnetism, magnetic flux conservation. When you shrink your star, the the magnetic field strength is bound to amplify by the square of the radius. So taking the magnetic field right now, shrinking it the size of the current star to the size of a neutron star, you would get a field that is as strong as those of magnetars, which is hundreds of trillions of Gauss. The, the more, let's say, critical question is, will the star really collapse into a neutron star? And this sensitively depends on its mass and the exact evolutionary state that is in and how much mass it will lose in the future. And our models suggest that it will collapse into a neutron star. But this is something that we have to remember is model dependent. Model dependent. Now, what's that look like? I mean, how many models do you have that could each potentially account for what we're seeing? So the, the, the big question is, it's model dependent in the sense that it's a question you can ask whether or not this star will eventually, when it ends its life, when it stops burning stuff, whether it will be, whether, whether it would exceed the Chandra Zekar mass limit which is 1.4 solar masses. So right now we know that it's two solar masses. We have an error on it of about 0.5. So you have to respect the error. Stars tend to lose mass as they evolve. I, I, this star actually doesn't really because of the magnetic field. The magnetic field kind of prevents almost all of the mass loss. But in, we don't know what will happen, especially in the final days of the star. Dramatic things can happen that can cause it to lose mass. So there is a debate on what exactly is the threshold above which such helium stars will undergo a core collapse. And that's somewhere in the range of two. But it's, a, it's really a debate that uh, goes down into the details. If it does not undergo core collapse, it will become a white dwarf and a very strongly magnetic white dwarf. But our models suggest that it will become a neutron star. Now, in regards to that, the Chandrasekhar limit of 1.4 solar masses, a highly magnetic white dwarf. Do, have we ever discovered one of those? I mean, a very high magnetism in a white dwarf? Yes. Not something I, at least a, a bit outside of my comfort zone, but definitely yeah, there are quite magnetic monsters among the white dwarfs. And in fact, every now and again, you hear about, uh, you know, the, the most magnetic white dwarf being measured. It's still kind of a competition. And yeah, they reach very high magnetic fields. I think up to about 10 trillion or something like this, they cannot reach the fields of well, it's not that they cannot, but they never reach the, the strength of magnetars, pro probably in part because they never become as compact. But yeah, there, there is a subclass of white dwarfs which are highly magnetic, and this could also be a progenitor for one of them. It's just that it's so massive that it seems to be rather a progenitor of a magnetar. Now, 
Where do you go from here? I mean, do you look for analogs? How do you continue the study of the, of this new class of star, the quasi wolf A star? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I mean, there are, there are still some things left to do with this object, especially now that we know it's so peculiar, so interesting also for people studying, you know, magnetic ma stellar magnetism. It's a very extreme beast and its interaction with us. So there are some observations we want to do with the star itself, continue monitoring it in, uh, with different techniques. But indeed, one of the things that I'm most excited about is to find analogs, just like you said. In fact, there must be a population of these stars out there. Like I, I am a strong believer of statistics. This star is about one kiloparsec away, like 3,000 or light years or so from Earth. The galaxy is like 100,000 light years across. So if you do the math, you would conclude that there are probably thousands of such objects in our galaxy. And dozens of them are probably readily observable and maybe even in our ca catalogs. So I think now that we know what kind of properties they possess, while needing to keep probably our minds open, I think we have a good prospect of narrowing down a subsample of promising candidates and then really pointing a spectral polarimeter at them and finding this really new, new population of objects. I think it's fascinating because magnetars are just really unusual objects and you know you, we've always wondered what what creates that you know um now i have a couple of nuts and bolts questions about just astronomy in general if you don't mind so i read that to take the measurements on this star you basically have to use the largest telescopes we have what's it like working with something like the canada france hawaii telescope or yeah. that big of an instrument it's exciting. It's kind of, it, you, yeah, you feel kind of a privilege to be working with that. It's uh, instruments that cost anything between millions and, and uh, billions of, of, of dollars to, to build. They're very competitive. So you have to convince a panel of experts that you should be getting the time to, to observe. And it's very precious data. So you want to make sure you don't do any silly mistakes and you use this time properly. And it's exciting. Do you actually have to go on site when you take observations or do you just say, you know, how's that work? Do you just instruct the astronomers on site or technicians or whatever to do this observation and then send me the data or do you actually have to go out there? Yeah, so usually you don't have to go out there. We distinguish between two modes. There is visitor mode and service mode. Service mode means indeed that someone does it for you. And most of these big telescopes has a, have a very oiled machinery of of managing these kind of observations for you. So I actually never had the pleasure of going to one of those big telescopes yet. Usually need a good excuse, like why would you need to go there? I, I actually suspect that if you would let me manage a telescope, I would break it down to pieces. So it's probably better that someone else does it for me. And yeah, it's just you, you, you specify quite precisely what exactly you want to do, how do you want to do it, which instrument, which setting, and so on. You prepare all of this. There is an expert that goes over the plan to make sure that it's feasible and, you know, you're not pointing the telescope to the earth or something. And and uh, if it gets green light, then it's it gets scheduled and they do it for you and you get the data when the data are there. How do you process the data once you get it? Do you have custom computer programs and things that you've written to sort of sort this data and, and figure out what you're seeing? Yeah, so that, that depends on the instrument. Most of the big instruments, like the space telescopes and the very large telescope, and this telescope as well, they have either they, they already send you data that have been largely processed as well, in addition to the original data, or they have software that are kind of published and you can use to reduce the data and analyze them. But sometimes it's not enough. So you, you sometimes want to write additional software. So it really depends. Like I just worked with uh, data from the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, for another project. And there I really had to write my own software to kind of uh, process the data. In this case, the data pretty much came processed. And the additional processing was done by the second author of this publication, who is Greg Wade, who is really the expert for spectral polarimetry. In regards to further observations of HD 45166, would larger aperture telescopes, which are coming, benefit it further as, as far as constraining down the characteristics of the star further than what you already have? And to a certain extent, you never know, but my feeling is that the improvement for this specific star would be incremental. Th this star was really like a, a beautiful example for, we really need all the aspects of the telescope. So it's just the right size. We had just the right sensitivity. The features that we were looking at are, are very small. They were right at the, you know, we really needed the quality that we had, the resolution, the sensitivity, the signal to noise. But now if you had like twice, I don't know, a telescope twice the size, you would get better data 
okay, you would nail down the magnetic field a bit more accurately, other properties maybe, but my feeling is that it would be incremental. Why it would be very beneficial is that, as I said, the star is relatively close. It is also pretty bright. It's 9.5 magnitude or so in the visual band. So if we want to find other such objects and generally explore mag stellar magnetism in larger scales in our galaxy or even uh, nearby galaxies like the Magellanic Clouds, we definitely need larger telescopes. And my last question for you as an astronomer studying stars and stellar physics, are there any other weird stars out there that are on your list for a future look? In other words, is there anything else out there that just doesn't really make any clear sense yet? Hmm. It's a good question. I think none of them that I can think of are keeping, keeping me as obsessed. There are definitely some weird objects out there that I've encountered, but most of them kind of, you know, you, you kind of brush them aside or maybe come back to them at a certain point. So nothing at the level, for me personally, nothing at the level of this object, because this was really like, I, I just, like nothing about it made sense to me. And the other objects, most of them make some sense, but they're, they're weird. So... I cannot give you a clear object here. Still, this this is exciting because it just goes to show you that you may not know about all that is possible yeah, <laughs> in the galaxy I until would, you really think it through. I would definitely not argue that. We all need to, to uh, remember, we need to maintain some humility. So much we don't know. Absolutely. But that's that's what makes it exciting. Doctor, thank you for joining us today. And I wish you great luck in your continued study of this star. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Anna, why is the possum surrounded by carrots with electrical wires stuck in them? He's performing an experiment, John. One that may net him the opossum version of the Nobel Prize. The prestigious Fleek Award. The what? Hey, wait a minute. He's turning the carrot array on. It appears to be working. Magnificent. Wait a minute. He's levitating. He's gone full-on superconductor. A possum temperature superconductor. I think the Fleek Award is in hand. Or paw, rather. He's floating around the room. And there aren't even any magnets. Careful, John. The wires. Ow! I fell over the trash can. Hey, that carrot was electrically hot. <laughs> 